This is Alan Freed. Back in 1951 in Cleveland, we coined a phrase that became the biggest pop musical era in the world. The words rock and roll. Strike it up! Three, four! You take my nerves and you rattle my brain. My When you want to break a record, take it to Cleveland, Ohio. A lot of national acts have broke out of here. Ooh. Cleveland, career, gotta be there. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has chosen Cleveland. We are the rock and roll capital of the world. There's only one Cleveland. Cleveland Rock! Welcome to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the crown jewel in Cleveland's rise to becoming the rock and roll capital of the world. Hi, I'm Channel 3's Monica Robbins. From a moondog to a buzzard, outsiders to pretenders, a casino to a ballroom. Over the next hour here on Cleveland Rocks, we're going to introduce you to the people, places, and events that not only put Cleveland, but all of Northeast Ohio in the rock and roll spotlight. And it all began with a little moondog madness. In July of 1951, broadcasting over WJW's 50,000 watt AM signal, Alan Freed's Moondog Show would expose a massive audience to rhythm and blues. A lot of people thought he was a black DJ just because of the way he, he talked and he knew the black artists so well. Hi everybody, how y'all? This is yours truly, Alan Freed. He made radio exciting to listen to. And listeners and performers alike took notice. Nobody had ever heard of rhythm and blues and rock and roll the way he did it. I couldn't go to school and have a conversation with the kids if I hadn't listened to Moondog at night because that's all we talked about at recess. Part of that excitement was Freed heavily pushing a phrase that would define music for generations to come. We coined a phrase that became the biggest pop musical era in the world, the words rock and roll. When he said this is rock and roll, he was talking about the feeling of the music, how you felt when you heard a particular song. But the words rock and roll may never have left Alan Freed's lips had it not been for the owner of Record Rendezvous, Leo Mintz. Uh, sometimes in interviews that Alan did in the 50s, he would uh, harken back to the fact that Leo had really been the one that had really pushed him in that direction, the, the terminology. Now, Freed may not have originated the term rock and roll, but there's no disputing the attention he got for the music he played. On March 21st, 1952, Freed hosted the Moondog Coronation Ball at the Cleveland Arena. Word quickly spread and a crowd of 25,000 fans showed up, but only 10,000 could get in. Just think about you know, what that says for this music and these artists, how, how it was exploding and how much, how much demand there was to be there. The first rock and roll concert ever staged cemented Alan Freed's influence on listeners, and his reputation grew to the point where New York stations came calling and whisked Cleveland's Moondog off to the Big Apple. He did such a job in creating this to be one of the big exports of America. This music is heard all over the world, and it probably started because Alan Freed played the records here in Cleveland. While Freed was bringing R&B music to his listeners, one of his rivals was about to expose America to the undisputed king of rock and roll. Bill Randall was the king maker. Working across town was Bill Randall, who not only had a daily show on WERE, but would fly off for a weekend radio gig in New York. Whatever records he played here, and he would play on the weekends in New York, all of a sudden, it really hits. And artists knew getting Randall behind their music was huge. When Bill Randall played your record, and if you were going to be a hit in Cleveland, it, it really meant something nationally, you know, that other, other stations would pick up on the record. But his gift for bringing future stars to light wasn't limited to just the radio. He was a master promoter as well. Bill Randall picked us up, of course, and took us to, every, we must have played every high school in Cleveland. Yeah. At the that sock hops. He's known for having a good ear to of what would be a, a hit maker. It was that ear for talent that would lead Randall and fellow W E R E DJ Tommy Edwards to book a hillbilly artist from the South for a concert at Brooklyn High School. We had no idea who he was. Teenagers then may not have known who Elvis Presley was, but the young man from Memphis definitely made his first performance here memorable. The girls were saying, wow, was he something? Wasn't he cute? And I think that really started it. It was the first show north of the Mason-Dixon line. 
and it was such a success they brought him back. Just three months after that performance, Randall would introduce Elvis Presley to all of America on CBS's The Stage Show. This young fellow we saw for the first time while making a movie short, we think tonight that he's going to make television history for you. We'd like you to meet him now. Elvis Presley, and here he is. And a nation got all shook up over someone Clevelanders were already hip to. How significant was that concert? In 1998, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame designated Brooklyn High School a historic landmark, calling it integral and in telling the story of rock and roll's formative moments. And that established Cleveland as, you know, the place where if you want to really be noticed, you know, play Cleveland. So you had a catchphrase, a hit maker, and a king making noise here. But compared to what was about to come out of Cleveland, that could have been just a whisper. Coming up next on Cleveland Rocks, a local television show gets audiences across America into the beat. And then, Cleveland Radio helps the world discover some of rock and roll's biggest stars. Welcome back to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland Rocks. You know, for many Americans, rock and roll really went mainstream when the Beatles appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show back in February 1964. We the Seven months later, the British invasion landed on the North Coast when the Beatles sold out Public Hall, a show many will never forget. There were 20,000 kids. I saw all these flash bulbs going off. And I just stood there in awe. Fans rushing the stage caused the show to be interrupted. The mayor banned the Fab Four from coming back to Cleveland. Fortunately, that ban was short-lived. The Beatles' return to Municipal Stadium in 1966 was just as memorable. It was pretty life-changing. To hear vocals like that just, just completely blew me away. And the ending of No More Man where they just nailed those notes and everything was like, oh my God, this is... I'll, I'll never hear anything like this again. And we wouldn't, at least not in person. The Beatles broke up never to return to the shores of Lake Erie. But the Beatles' Cleveland concerts were more than just a music revolution for fans. They actually changed the way radio stations went after listeners. They were fighting to be the first ones to get the Beatles exclusive on, on their station, and everything kind of kicked into gear. AM powerhouse WHK landed the Public Hall concert. The Beatles' 1966 tour put another local station on the broadcast map. We brought the Beatles in and it made everybody sit up and take notice and say, wow, these guys are for real. Broadcasting with just a 5,000 watt signal, Wixie 1260 made up for a lack in wattage with personality and imagination. Good night, big city. Keep on thinking free. DJs like the Duker, the Wild Child, Lou King Kirby, Billy Bass, Jack Armstrong, and others grab listeners with their unique styles. I think it was the only station anybody listened to. But it was what the Wixie 1260 jocks did off the air that really got attention. They knew how to promote their station in the most offbeat way that you could imagine. From Chicken Man to the Supermen, Wixie jocks were constantly out or up and about. We did things that brought the community together. Or 100,000 people to a concert. The Wixie Appreciation Day, the hottest acts in the world were brought into Cleveland and 100,000 people would show up. All those efforts paid off. Within about a, a two year or three year period, Wixie 1260 had the highest AM radio ratings in all of America. Norman Wayne knew how to put that combination together, great music, great personalities, great promotion, and just be involved in the city. And Wixie became the soundtrack of Cleveland for many, many years. But then FM radio arrived, and just as quickly as Wixie 1260 rose to the top, listeners switched frequencies. What really took Wixie to the hearts and minds of Clevelanders is that we took the show to them. And we did it every day, every week, every year for six years. While FM was just beginning to grab listeners' ears, something else already had their eyes. It's America's top contemporary music show, Upbeat. My father had an idea of taking top 40 radio and putting it on TV, and that's what he did. In August of 1964, producer Herman Spiro and WEWS Television debuted the Big Five show. It was the first rock and roll show that wasn't a dance party. It was the anti- uh, American Bandstand. Showcasing multiple music acts every week, the Big Five show quickly grew a devoted following. I think that we afforded the audience an opportunity to see 
not just listen to the records, but see, see the people perform live. The Big Five show became bigger than anyone could have imagined. It became so successful, uh, we syndicated after about a year. And it was syndicated in over 100 cities. Then it became the Upbeat show. That made Upbeat Studios a destination station for any act hoping to make it big. I must have done the Upbeat show two dozen times. The Monkees and Jerry Lee Lewis, any kind of Motown act, he'd always have some new artists that he would try to preview, and he would also try to have somebody from Cleveland on every show. The great opportunity to break a record. Great God in heaven, you know I know. You know, there were too many situations like that across the country. There were a few local shows, but there weren't local shows that had gone to a large degree national. Everybody got to see you. We'd be on the road and might be midnight, we'd catch ourselves in Boston or catch ourselves in uh, Chicago. It was on all over, so you got that exposure. It was another thing that just drove home to the artists. Cleveland, career, gotta be there. Upbeat eventually lost its groove with viewers and the studio lights dimmed for good in 1971. During the years that we did it, I don't think that anybody realized the, the importance and, and the, the magnitude of the whole thing. Recognition of Upbeat's contributions did come when the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame named WEWS Studios a rock and roll landmark in 2000. One reason record labels love sending acts to Cleveland is that they could accomplish two things in one trip. The artist could appear on Upbeat in the morning and then play at a club like Leo's Casino that night. Everyone played Leo's. Everyone. The place I remember performing at the most was Leo's Casino. You look up and it'd be a whole line out there in front of Johnny trying to get in that club. The places were big and they were packed. Canton natives and future Rock and Roll Hall of Famers, the OJs, considered Leo's a home away from home. We probably hit Leo's five times a year. We rehearsed there. It got us in front of people that we wouldn't have had an opportunity. It got us audience that we uh, wouldn't have had a chance to be. Record labels considered Leo's a crucial venue for their artists, but it was what was happening with the audience that would cement the club's place in rock and roll history. It was a melting pot. The most successful integrated club in the United States. It's where black and white came together. Everybody was there just for music, and, I, and I, that really enhanced the reputation of the, of the city to a very great degree. Leo's Casino closed its doors in 1972, but the club's musical and cultural legacy was preserved when the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame named its former location as another Cleveland rock and roll landmark. What happened in the 60s with the Beatles, Wixie, Upbeat, and Leo's Casino exposed Clevelanders and the rest of the country to a wide variety of rock and roll music, but it would pale in comparison to the sounds of the 70s. When Cleveland Rocks returns, we're talking buzzards, falcons, and the club bands couldn't pass on playing. And the power of the people helps bring the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to Northeast Ohio. If the 60s was about the sights, sounds, and scenes like the Beatles, Upbeat, and Leo's Casino, the next evolution of rock and roll in Cleveland could be summed up with one word, synergy. You know, we had the Belkins as a major promoter. We had the Agora. Well, you could really tie this thing together and make it work. 101 WMMS. WMMS's music selection got everyone's attention. On any given day, you've got a new Van Morrison, a new Led Zeppelin, a new Beatles. The Stones, uh, uh, James Taylor, Joni Mitchell. There was a culture around that station. Everybody was listening. All the stations around the country started playing whatever we were playing. MMS certainly in the 70s broke acts like Bowie, Springsteen, Southside Johnny. We've had a connection with radio here that we don't have in a lot of other places. People not only listen, they watch too. And we also did the Cotton Bay concerts, the free concert at the Agora. Nobody was doing live, live you know, concerts. We were in a room at noon with 800 people seeing something really groundbreaking. I had nine stations in Ohio that were playing that show. And that's what made Cleveland as large as it was, the fact that play Cleveland, 
you're covered. Some of their live broadcasts would sort of get circulated around on, on cassette tapes back in the day. There were so many acts that debuted on that Cottage Bay concert that, you know, went on to, you know, fame and fortune. The power to make or break acts had labels knocking on the station's doors. The perception was you better get the record on WMMS or you're a dead duck. That mix of music and concerts earned WMMS a devoted following. When Rolling Stone magazine started doing the reader's poll, right away MMS was a hometown favorite. How strong was the response? Fan votes sent WMMS to the top of Rolling Stone magazine's reader's poll for nine straight years. That is, until ballot stuffing allegations took some luster off that poll. But the artist discoveries, concerts, even the Rolling Stone rankings, None of it would have happened had it not been for one thing. I think what made MMS so special was the fact that there was so much homegrown talent. A crew of jocks that I've never seen assembled before, and I've built clubs in, you know, 12, 13 other cities. And there was so much the pulse of what was going on in the city. Each one had his own show, his own identity, his own music. That's what made it so great. It was a people that just meshed together in a, a lot of different ways. We were doing our best to live up to the heritage of Cleveland music. The marriage between radio and the club owners was really terrific as far as the radio DJs would play the songs and then they would get the artists to come and the, the artists would play the Agora. When you say Agora to me, I, it immediately rings a, a bell in Cleveland. I thought about us for a long, long time. You name it, everybody played there. We played about every English act that came to town. The police grew from Ireland like you too. You didn't know who they were today, and uh, six months later after they played the Agora, they were big time. Bruce Springsteen played the Agora, David Bowie, you name it. The list is, is incredible. Local bands on the road to stardom often started out playing for Hank LaConte. We uh, cut our teeth uh, playing the Agora. That gave us the experience and the know-how to go up to New York and make good records. We were completely free to do whatever we wanted. You know, it was our best judgment. And that, that's the way a band grows. So that was the magic of the Agora. And the magic grew well beyond Cleveland. He was one of the first people who really did that kind of House of Blues model of the same kind of chain. Cleveland's Agora would spawn 13 other clubs in cities like Atlanta, Dallas, Tampa, even Moscow, Russia. But they would all close, leaving the current Agora to keep on rocking. I guess I'm very lucky that I was there at the right time. And it was always having the right people with me. While his ear for music helped break some of Rock's biggest names, Hank LaConte's greatest attribute may be what he kept in his heart, the fans. And you've got a guy who really understands music, really loves music, passionate about music, wants to give new bands a chance, but also knows that his bread and butter are those people who come in every night and they have to be treated well. Two other men who knew about respect were building a reputation as the top promoters in Northeast Ohio. When you went to a Belkin concert, you had great treatment. They always, always, always put on the best concerts, introduced bands that may not have gotten a chance anywhere else. They were willing to take a chance. You'd have the Who, the James Gang, and James Taylor. It's like, well, how do you put James Taylor, especially in the middle of this? It worked. Brothers Jules and Mike Belkin each possessed unique skills that would help them succeed. Mike probably had much better ear than I did for rock and roll. He was the music man and I was kind of the, the businessman. Belkin Productions' partnership with WMMS solidified Cleveland's rock reputation with the World Series of Rock. The music was growing by leaps and bounds. The next thing after the, after the, after the public hall was the stadium. It was a big move on Belkin's part, it really was. It was a big move and it was an astute move because obviously the market was ready. The Belkin's World Series of Rock summer concerts would run for six years at Municipal Stadium. They started having every name possible performing down there. Rolling Stones, Aerosmith, Jefferson Starship, Rod Stewart, Pink Floyd. Man, there was just so many good ones. And they were all sellouts. Think about it. Selling out every square foot of that stadium for rock and roll concerts. We had 82,500 people 
in the stadium. It was the, the largest stadium show at that time ever in the in the state. People were coming in from a, from a number of areas to see this all-day concert that made Cleveland its destination. Concerts that many fans and Jules Belkin will never forget. A feeling of accomplishment and at the same time knowing that there were 82,000 people there that helped to support this music business in Cleveland. So you had the radio stations, the promoters, and the clubs all working together to make Cleveland a hot rock and roll scene. But landing the crown jewel in Cleveland's rock and roll story would take more synergy and energy than anyone could have imagined. We'll look at how all of Northeast Ohio rallied to bring the Rock Hall to Cleveland when Cleveland Rocks returns. And later, the hometown heroes who made musical marks on the charts. In spring of 1985, two groups were working on one very important goal, a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But where they wanted to put it couldn't have been further apart. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Music industry executives, including Cleveland native Norman Knight, were putting together a plan to locate a rock hall in the Big Apple. We have Ahmet Erdogan, we have also Seymour Stein, we have Jan Wenner, we have all... And all of a sudden, bells started ringing in my head. I said, wow, that sounds like something could happen with these people. Meanwhile, another group wanted to put the Hall of Fame where rock and roll got its name, Cleveland. Our strategy kind of shifted from Cleveland, uh, doing it by themselves, to going to try to convince New York that Cleveland would be a location for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I said, Michael, I, uh, yeah, it's going to be in New York. I said, if anybody can even discuss it, it would have to be Norman Knight because he's on the board. He made a phone call to me and he said, hey, listen, could you fly into Cleveland because we'd love to be able to talk to you. By then, we had gotten the mayor behind it at the time, uh, now Senator George Voinovich and the governor, Dick Celeste, and Congress people and a lot of the business community, but pretty quietly. Norman Knight tells him, you know, they're building it in New York, but he says, I'll ask. You know, I'll at least put the word there. Just Amit and myself in his office, and I said, what do you think about being able to put the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio? And he said, absolutely not. And I said, but Amit, consider the fact, Alan Freed, it's a neutral city. I mentioned a lot of things, and I must have hit the right button. We got permission to go to New York before any of the rest of the country really knew what was going on. We really did it with a rock and roll approach. We blew them away in New York. Cleveland did the presentation, hit a home run with it because after the presentation, they all were applauding, and then after that, Susan Evans got a note from uh, one of the people at the meeting and says, I guess we're going to Cleveland. Buoyed by that positive response, Cleveland's team intensified their efforts to prove the Rock Hall belonged here. We started a petition drive, we started radio interviews, we tried to wind Cleveland up. We gave them over 650,000 signed petitions, which was more than the capacity of Cleveland. We dropped that in front of them. When you drop 660,000 signatures on paper about this high, they were pretty impressed. The Rock Hall board toured Cleveland in September, taking in all that Cleveland had to offer as a potential site for the museum. On the plane going back to New York, they, they really said, I think that we have something special here in Cleveland. Word spread about a possible rock hall. So in January 1986, USA Today asked America which city deserved to have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In a battle of David versus multiple Goliaths, Cleveland rose to the challenge. We had the trust of our listeners, and this was one time that we were saying, okay guys, we need your help on this one. We got on the air at 6 o'clock in the morning and pounded that number. We want you to jam those phone lines. Your chance to show your support on a national level to get the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame here. After one day, Cleveland led cities like Memphis, New York, and Los Angeles by over 46,000 votes. Apparently, it wasn't enough. So they extended the poll for two days which is the wrong thing to do. It's like waving a red flag at a bull that's already charging. It was an all-out push. Every radio station, TV station, it was an unbelievable effort. When the dialing was done, there was no doubt about Northeast Ohio's passion for rock and roll. Cleveland had more than 110,000 votes. Second place, Memphis, with a little more than 7,200. When you got that kind of vote, how can you say no? It showed the country and the people in New York, how much Cleveland wanted it. Unsure whether or not the poll swayed the Rock Hall's board, Cleveland stayed in New York's mind by doing what it does best, 
rocking on. We had to crank up the heat. A Moondog Coronation Ball anniversary concert was held. Rock and roll was thrown a birthday party on Public Square. We used every trick in the book that we could think of to get their attention that we really wanted this. New York saw how important that was. Finally, on May 5th of 1986, after a series of late night meetings, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame chose a home. Directors of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has chosen Cleveland as the site for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And a city rejoiced over a hard fought victory. One of these days, there will be a rock concert in Cleveland that is broadcast all over the world. So Cleveland won the battle for the Rock Hall, but finding the funds to build the museum would be an even bigger challenge. There was all of that extra money to raise, and, but um, we did it. It was, you know, the, the city, the county, the state, everybody wanted to make sure that that thing was going to be here. A star-studded groundbreaking ceremony was held at North Coast Harbor in June of 1993. Philadelphia is still mad at me for voting for <laughs> Cleveland, but uh, I thought this is where the place should be. After two years of construction, fundraising, and membership drives, Cleveland was ready to show the world its crown jewel. Rock and Roll's biggest names flocked to town for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's grand opening on September 1st, 1995. We did it. We did it. Tell the world, we did it! It's fantastic and the Hall of Fame is great. Parades were held, parties were thrown, and Governor Celeste's words came true when HBO broadcast the inaugural Rock Hall concert live from Municipal Stadium. I feel good! I feel good. For those who helped to make the Rock Hall dream a reality in Cleveland, the long, hard journey was well worth it. This is the one and only Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There'll never be another one. It's here in Cleveland, Ohio, and we should be proud. And I'm just so happy for Cleveland that they have this, this jewel here on the shores of Lake Erie. It's so gratifying to have people, friends, come from out of town and, and say the first thing they want to do is let's go to the Rock Hall. That's ours, we deserve it. It's more than bricks and mortar. It's something that is a living and breathing and exciting place. It's something that has helped Cleveland continue to be on the map. So how does the museum keep Cleveland in the rock and roll spotlight? We'll explore the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's mission and what it means to all of Northeast Ohio when Cleveland Rocks continues. Welcome back to Cleveland Rocks. After all the energy spent bringing the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame here, Let's take a look at what it means to all of Northeast Ohio. Cleveland is identified with the Rock Hall. The Rock Hall is really well branded globally. It means a lot. It's a draw. This is the center of the universe. It's a pretty amazing landmark for Cleveland and it just makes it, it makes it eternally cool. I've been coming to Cleveland for a very long time. This used to be dead men walking territory down through here before the Rock Hall of Fame. Now so many people come through here, it's just, it's just wonderful. We get about uh, close to 500,000 visitors every year. For any museum, it's not either in New York or Washington, D.C., that's a phenomenal number. That makes the Rock Hall number one for Halls of Fame in the United States. More than 90% of those folks come from outside of the Cleveland area. We tend to get visitors from all 50 states and then from about 100 different countries every year. We estimate that every year the Rock Hall contributes something on the order of $100 million to the Northeast Ohio economy. It's actually a stunning impact. This has met our expectations and in some instances surpassed what we had hoped to achieve. Now that we know how much of an economic engine the Rock Hall is for Northeast Ohio, it's fueled by two things, exhibits and education outreach. We were coming here and I looked up and said, oh my goodness, gentlemen, Look what we're going into. Oh man, I mean, I went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame today. I had an amazing time. It's a great place to come uh, and uh, realize the history of music. We go from the roots of rock and roll, we have a section that looks at you know, the blues, rhythm and blues, gospel, country folk and bluegrass, all the way up to the present. It's really a tour through musical history. The exhibits are fantastic. You're gonna find something that touches your heart here. There's something for everybody that way, and that's the beauty of it. What we do try to do is, is bring about what, um, you know, how the artists were how the music was impacted by what was going on at that time. What's really important about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is that it is alive. You know, that these instruments and these players are still around or they're venerated or they're saluted. And you get a sense of 
of, of who they are. I think the memorabilia will become more intense as time goes on. We do a new major exhibit basically almost every year. We do smaller exhibits, um, you know, every, every few months we'll change those. As the technology progresses, you'll even get more intense. We're also embarking on a redesign of the museum's exhibits. We're going to be upgrading all of our audio and video technology, all of our uh, interactive kiosks and all that, and then we're also going to change, move around some of the exhibits so we'll tell the story in a little bit more chronological way. A wealth of knowledge is under this roof, and, and uh, those that don't know about it should have and find a great pleasure in learning about it. Hopefully when someone comes through here, they, they can really get to see how the music has changed over the years, where it's gone, who the important artists were, and all that, and, and you know, its impact on the culture. The mission of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, of course, is one of the key things is to preserve the history of this music uh, and to teach the world about it. One of the best things about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum is the educational programming. They take this music seriously, and it deserves to be studied seriously. I think it's very important for people to learn about the history of rock and roll because it's one of the most significant art forms in the world over the last you know, half a century or so. And the Hall of Fame is just doing a wonderful job by educating uh, the fans and the public about that history. The Rock Hall carries, I think, a special significance because I think because it is music and students are often defined by their music, uh, it offers a unique opportunity for the instructional process to take place. I wish when I was in school, uh, I could have taught a, you know, I could have learned a, a, you know, history of rock and roll. For us to sit on a stage and people ask questions and do a good interview with the cameras rolling and, and having fun doing it means a lot to us. We really reach around the country and around the world through our distance learning program, which is called On the Road. We've reached uh, 41 states and six countries. It's really cool for these students to take classes in the history of rock and roll because it really ties in a lot of the things they're talking about in their, their history classes or in their English classes when it comes to analyzing lyrics of a song or something of that nature. What they give back to the community, free concerts and, and forums and lectures that are open to the, uh, the community, it's not too many other institutions do the same thing. And you also have to live up to the music every day. You have to try to teach in a way and present classes in a way that live up to what you think the power of the music is itself. The Rock Hall's education, outreach, and exhibits are two powerful reasons why people come here. But soon, they'll have another, the Library and Archives at Tri-C. Uh, my fantasy is to be locked in the Library and Archives. I want to just get lost in there for weeks. When it does open, it'll really be the center for the study of rock and roll. With more than 22,000 square feet of space, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's Library and Archives will be a treasure trove for the casual fan or the most serious of music scholars. The Library and Archives is going to provide both some of the basic resources in the history of the music, basic reference texts and, and books and periodicals, but also a terrific video and audio archive. Journalists, historians, scholars, students, whatever the general public can go in and really you know, have a place where they can go through the uh, private papers of uh, a lot of the major figures in the music business and really it's going to be, you know, it just takes, takes us to another level. And there's really, you know, there's no facility like this anywhere else in the world. Another key to the Rock Hall success in Cleveland, their foundation in New York. We could not have accomplished all these things in recent times without their support. And there's many more great things to be done, and they're just itching at the bit to get that done as we are. So we're looking forward to you know, taking this to the next level and, and really doing even more great things in the future. It's another feather in Cleveland's cap. And another reason why Cleveland is the rock and roll capital of the world. Next year, you'll be able to check out the library and archives yourself. And coming up next, we'll take a look at Northeast Ohio's rock and roll royalty, the living proof of why Cleveland rocks. So Cleveland gave rock and roll its name, staged its first concert, dominated the airwaves, and gave several superstars their first break. But when it comes to homegrown talent, Northeast Ohio can hold its own with any region in the country. One of the records that I fell in love with was uh by a Cleveland group called The Outsiders. We raised about 120 bucks to go in and cut uh, our first song, which was uh, Time Will Let Me. Time will let me sing it. The Outsiders hit number five on the U.S. charts in February of 1966. The way we recorded it is the way we signed with Capitol Records and the way they put it out. It was a huge hit for us, and so it got us traveling all over the world. Sonny Geraci and the Outsiders charted three more times, becoming the first Cleveland group to really get America's attention. 
The James Gang was, for three guys, it's amazing how much noise they made. Well, we wanted to play so badly. Um, and all of a sudden there were people who wanted us to play. It was like, well, let's go. Funk 49, Walk Away, and Midnight Man powered two James Gang albums up the charts. I don't think people really used the word power trio back then, but that's a template that they pretty much invented. Another reason the James Gang put Cleveland on the map, guitarist Joe Walsh would later become a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer as a member of the Eagles. It's hard to find anybody that things better than the OJs. Once America caught the Canton natives' Philly soul sound, they couldn't get enough putting seven OJ singles in the top 20. We sounded good and they wanted to keep rehearsing and keep practicing and that hard work paid off. Especially in 2005 when the OJs were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There is no greater award than this one. This one lasts forever. Talk about a legend. Bobby Womack, come on. Cleveland's Bobby Womack dominated the R&B charts, churning out 15 top 20 hits. Womack became a hometown hero when he was inducted into the Rock Hall last year. It's great me being back home in Cleveland. Been gone a long time, but I'm glad to be back tonight. The Raspberries were one of the great singles bands of all time. I mean, they made some of the greatest singles of all time. Soaring melodies, beautiful harmonies, and slashing guitar. The Raspberries netted three top 20 singles over their three years together, but their legacy is seen among artists like Kiss's Paul Stanley, Bruce Springsteen, and Tom Petty, who've all cited the Cleveland band as an influence. In our day, you had to be good. You had to really be able to play. You know, I'm old school, but I'm very proud of it, too. There's Michael Stanley, who had a tremendous show traveled all over Ohio, all over the world, actually. Strike it up! The myth about Michael Stanley is that he only happened in Cleveland. The Michael Stanley band nailed two top 40 hits. We were a serious road band. We were out there forever. We had a lot of chart records. We sold a lot of records. We saw the world. And, you know, if on some level that isn't successful, I don't know what is. It was successful for me. The reason that I've been successful is I surround myself with people that I think are really, really good at what they do. I was at Christmas Records when the Pretenders album first came out, and we all just went like, oh my God, we want that act. We did have important people come out of this area, but Chrissy went on to an international level that um, I think was unsurpassed. Hind and the Pretenders had five top 20 hits and were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2005. Northeast Ohioans have made their musical marks not only in the pop music charts, but also in a wide variety of rock genres. We put together wildly divergent, divergent people and turned them loose. You know, as I say, it was anarchy. Per Ubu has gained an international following for their unique sound. It was very industrial based. You know, all of those guys learned how to play instruments just to do this. We knew that nobody would ever like us. Nobody would ever uh, give us a, a job or a show or a record. And that's a very liberating place to be because then you do it for yourself. Right from the beginning, we conceived Devo as a multimedia thing. These guys were light years, just light years ahead of what was going on. MTV picked up Devo's Whip It video and helped push the song to number 14 on the charts. But it was Devo's techno talent that helped set the standard for groups to come. We were the new in New Wave, and that was exciting. Several other acts out of Northeast Ohio have had rock and roll success as well. Cleveland native Tracy Chapman is a four-time Grammy winner who scored two top 10 hits in her career. Canton's Macy Gray is another Grammy winner for her number one hit, I Try. Cleveland's Bone Thugs and Harmony won a Grammy in 1997 and have rhymed their way to four top 20 hits on the Hot 100 charts. Industrial rockers Nine Inch Nails, formed here in Cleveland, have two Grammys and had three albums placed first or second on the Billboard Top 200 chart. And don't forget Canton's Marilyn Manson. The Shock Rockers had three top 10 albums, including two that hit the top of the charts. 
There are two non-performers who everyone agrees helped put Cleveland in the rock and roll spotlight. Steve Popovich was one of the key behind the scenes figures in Cleveland's music history. He was able to sign the Jacksons, um, which then became responsible for Michael Jackson. Among other things, he was the guy responsible for breaking Meatloaf. After major labels passed on Meatloaf's second album, Popovich released it on his own Cleveland International label. Bad Out of Hell went on to become the fifth best-selling album of all time, with 43 million sold and counting. Then there's the first lady of rock journalism. Jane Scott was my hero. Rock and roll has brought young people together like nothing else has ever done in the past. Her first gig was covering the Beatles at Public Hall in 1964, and from that show, she never looked back. It wasn't as much about being critical of how somebody did something. It was about telling the story of what they did. And because of that, I think she found a niche. She found a place with these artists that very few other writers for publications had. There you have it, a brief look at who built Cleveland's rock and roll reputation. And while it all may seem like past glory, when Cleveland Rocks returns, we're gonna show you the rock and roll scene that's alive and kicking. We've spent a lot of time talking about what made Cleveland rock in the past. Now let's dive into who and what keeps Northeast Ohio a rockin' place to be. I was really surprised when I got here at what an incredibly diverse city this is, uh, what an incredible music scene there is. When it comes to the club scene in Cleveland, one venue in particular is growing near and dear to everyone's heart. <laughs> Thank God for like the Beachland Ballroom. Colin Wood's Beachland Ballroom has become a hotspot for music fans and artists alike. The Beachland is, I gotta tell you, a great place to hear rock and roll. The artists are just a few feet away from you. You're part of the action. I think it's a gem. That's why we did two concerts there. It has a feeling and a sound that made us feel very comfortable. It, it reminded us of the great rooms we played 30 and 40 years earlier. Acts passing through the Beachland Ballroom have gone on to literally sing its praises to the world. Glenn Tilbrook from Squeeze actually wrote a song called Beachland Ballroom. Sleater Kinney told Rolling Stone it was their favorite venue to play in America. Esquire Magazine calls the Beachland one of the top 100 bars in America, while Blender Magazine says it has the best jukebox. It's just wonderful that people have embraced what we've been trying to do. Clubs like the Beachland Ballroom and the Agora give local artists that crucial first break. And just like in years past, Cleveland has a lot of talent for clubs to choose from. Two examples would be the Black Keys and Kid Cudi, both of them of Northeast Ohio roots. Both of them have gone on to uh, superstardom. Well, the Black Keys are, should be, you know, um, a little crown, a little jewel in your crown. Dan Auerbach and Patrick Carney became the Black Keys while performing in Akron's underground scene. They have two top 20 rock albums, a top 25 hit, and a top 10 rap album. Cleveland native Kid Cudi has blossomed into one of hip hop's hottest stars. His debut album hit number four on the charts, while his debut single rocketed up to number three. He's really putting his own spin on hip hop he doesn't remind you of a lot of rappers, he does his own thing. And Bay Village's Kate Bowler scored two top 40 hits, while also starring in the CW Network's One Tree Hill. This TV show's been fabulous because, you know, anymore, a radio hit isn't necessarily enough. You really have to find creative ways to promote your music, so, so One Tree Hill's been, been that for me. While the Black Keys, Kate Vogel, and Kid Cudi represent the here and now of Cleveland's rock scene, you don't have to look too far to find Northeast Ohio's next generation of rock and rollers. We've got countless examples of young people in this area who are keeping the music alive, moving it forward. School of Rock has a couple of locations here where, you know, teenage musicians, some even younger than that, are learning not only the history of the music, but putting their own spin on it. Directed locally by Donny Iris and the Cruisers drummer Tommy Rich, the School of Rock is a national institution that's helping young rockers grow into the music we all love. It's a performance-based instruction in, in rock and roll music. Kids come here for lessons, all the rock instruments, vocals, bass, guitars, drums, keyboards. The same week that they're here for their lesson, they're also here for three-hour rehearsals in shows that we produce. So many parents have come back to, to us and said, you know, so-and-so was quiet, you know, very reserved, couldn't get a peep out of him, him or her. And 
the, the change has been remarkable. It gives you a sense of leadership and responsibility. I love it here. And to see young people taking it up now, even more so at a younger age, is, is overwhelming. Cutting the first record, it's a goal of all up and coming wannabe rock stars like the kids at the School of Rock. Fortunately, they don't have to travel far to find a first-rate recording studio. Annie Up Recording, which is bringing national artists in to record again in Cleveland. We went into it with the idea that we could kind of create this destination studio for uh, acts from out of town while also really giving uh, the local and regional uh, talent uh, an actual studio to work out of. You've had people like Dave Matthews record there because it is a world-class facility. Michael Seifert was great, you know, an amazing talent who's right here in Cleveland and I was lucky enough to work with him for my first EP and it was awesome, you know, it was pretty exciting to find somebody locally in Cleveland who just really knew what they were doing. If we can start bringing in bigger and bigger projects from out of town as well, labels I think will pay more attention to what's going on and I mean that's kind of what you need to do to really get the scene jump started. And it's not just people boosting Cleveland's rock reputation. There's uh, now actual manufacturing going on in Cleveland. Fortune Drums is a well-known drum provider. Drummers are, are a community that, hey, what are you playing there? Let me show you that. Hey, where'd you get that sound at? You know, what are you doing? So there's a lot of that sharing. A, a lot of my business comes from those relationships that get built. Which is a phenomenal thing if you're at the level and you can afford it to have a drum set made to your every specification. And for cranking up the volume, there's Dr. Z's amps. It's a vintage designed vacuum tube amplifier. They're very proud that it's made in America, that it's made right here with American products hand assembled and tested here. You turn on the Tonight Show or whatever and there's this band there and they have nothing to do with Cleveland but they're playing Z amps. From entertainers to innovators, rock and roll is definitely alive and well in Northeast Ohio. But what's kept our passion for the music going through the years? When we come back, we'll hear from the artists themselves about the fans and their rock and roll fever. So Cleveland's got a rich rock and roll history, but what's kept that passion going all these years? Let's find out from the artists and innovators themselves on what they think of our love for rock and roll, why they had to make it here, and what they think about you, the fans. Put something on the turntable. People work hard, but then they want to relax or they want to have an outlet. And your friends come over and... If you go see a good live band... Listen to this. No, man, listen to this. This is cool, too. It's healing. Listening to music is a great alternative. You don't get great rock music in Miami or L.A. Once again, the weather... It's cloudy in Cleveland. Gives people more of a rock and roll attitude. It comes from Cleveland, it comes from Seattle, it comes from London, it comes from Dublin. If you're living in paradise, there's not much effort that you have to put into anything. The word around America was when you want to break a record, take it to Cleveland, Ohio. If you could break a song in Cleveland, make it a hit, it could go anywhere in the United States. Because we were a multicultural town. A lot of records broke out of Ohio, a lot of groups. Cleveland led the country in music sales. Pound for pound, maybe more than anywhere else. People heard things that they didn't hear in other markets. We had a larger percentage buying music than any other city in America. The artists really respected Cleveland because Cleveland had really intelligent audiences. And the fans in Ohio really are sort of the epicenter of rock and roll. and I. You know, I, I mean that sincerely. This was the town that responded to us in a way that no other place did. The fans here have always been great. The best audiences were Cleveland. They've always been really wild. And the people here, they love, they love their rock and roll, man. And they're very loyal. Cleveland just was something special. There's no doubt about it. We were real America. We were right in the middle. We got it. We respected it. And we lived it. And by all accounts, we keep on living it. I hope you've enjoyed our look at what's made Cleveland and all of Northeast Ohio the rock and roll capital of the world. And I hope you tell us about your favorite concert memories in Cleveland Rockers. You can do that on our website, wkyc.com slash Cleveland Rocks. You can also watch online extras and full length interviews of everybody from tonight's show. On behalf of everyone at Channel 3 and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Thank you so much for watching, and never forget, Cleveland rocks. Cleveland is the rock and roll capital of the world because
Cleveland rocks, it always has. The essence, the, the true nature of rock and roll, the true magic of rock and roll is embedded in, in the ground here, in the earth, in Lake Erie. I mean, we grew rock and roll right here in Cleveland. This is where it happened, and this is where the energy lives. There's only one Cleveland.